Good morning, everybody. Uh, Mike Doe here. Um, we're just going to wait a couple minutes and let others join. Uh, I am also here with my good friend, Scott Stingle. Hello, everyone. Scott, we're, uh, we're just waiting for others to join us, so... All right, and I see, uh, it looks like Melko is on, that's great. Um, if you are online with us, if you could say good morning, let us know where you're from, that would be great. We're gonna just kind of chill for a couple minutes here, let everybody uh, get connected, and we've got some really, really exciting stuff to cover uh, on basically making you more like Scott Stingle out of the box. So <laughs> all the cool tricks that Scott has as a, how many years have you been digitizing, Scott? Mm, uh, 34. 34 years, and he's only 36 years old, so that's the crazy thing. So, um, yeah, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those, uh, you know, secret hacks that make uh, embroidery designs look so good. We're gonna, we're gonna find out that uh, Scott has has put those in. So, uh, Alexandra from Toronto uh, says good morning. Good morning to you up in Canada. Hopefully you guys are starting to see spring come. Uh, I know here in Colorado, spring looks like a lot of snowstorms. Uh, so crazy, crazy. Uh, and uh, uh, Jaship says, morning, we all we all going to be Scott now. Yes, I think that <laughs> the more we're like Scott when it comes to digitizing, the better things are going to be out of the box. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, let's see who else has said good morning to us today. I missed anybody else. We're going to give it about another minute, guys, and then we'll be going. Um, once again, we are on YouTube and Facebook Live. Um, uh, Beth um, says good morning from Oklahoma, uh, Barry, Barry Hill, Oklahoma. Um, I think that, Beth, is that close to Oklahoma City or is that closer to Tulsa? That's about like the two landmarks that I think of when it comes to Oklahoma. Um, so let's see what she has to say back. Um, and we're looking pretty good, Scott. So once again, if you're joining us late, um, my name is Mike Doe here at Melco. Actually, I'm here in my house getting ready to go back to Melco, but um, part of the applications team at Melco here with my good friend Scott Stingle, and Scott is going to walk us through some really cool, um, they might seem like they're small things, but really cool uh, features and functions of Design Shop V11. Um, and so Rudy is saying that my, my volume seems really low, so let me see if I can fix that, Rudy. Hold on one second here. Um, Beth said it's closer to Tulsa. Okay, I've got I've got family in Tulsa. Of course, I haven't been up there to see them lately, but um, uh, let me know if that uh, that microphone sound, my audio is better for you guys. But um, Scott, why don't you take it away? I will share your screen with everybody. And when you're ready, bud, you are good to go. All right, so uh, I'm just gonna cover two topics. Um, first is our excuse me, our uh, large monitor or 4K um, support with Design Shop 11. And also I'll uh, let you know of what the changes we've made to the new defaults um, to make you more successful right when you get started. Um, so here we can see this is Design Shop 10. Um, it might not translate so well on your side because you're not seeing the, the 4K that I am, but uh, we were out to uh, increase the icon size, the boldness of the text, everything to make Design Shop work better in today's world, which is uh, higher and higher res monitors. Um, so you can see um, the proportions anyway with Design Shop 10. My mouse cursor, which uh, hasn't been enlarged, is you know bigger than most things, uh, icons and all that kind of stuff on the screen. So uh, let me show you V11. Um, also, this is uh, 
11.2.126. We've put that up on the upgrade server. And if you do have 11, um, please uh, tools check for updates and get the new version from the release. Some uh, minor changes, bug fixes, uh, translations for our foreign friends and all that kind of stuff. But um, it's it, you definitely want to go for the um, the latest version of the service pack. So uh, here is V11, and you can see how much larger everything is in proportion to the way that 10 was. Um, 10 had one size icons. Um, we have three sizes here. So let me show you, first of all, I'm using medium because as I've explained before, 27 inch 4K monitor. Um, they're kind of getting to be common now. So if you want to make the jump from the HD resolution to um, high definition or 4K, um, it's not that expensive. Chances are your video card, if the computer is reasonably new, might already support 4K. The monitors, depending on what size you want, um, 250 to 350 um, for a, a good size one. 27 is big enough for me. Of course, two of them works really good. Um, but it, it is so such a pleasure to work with it and all the crispness and how easy it is on your eyes. So uh, I would encourage if you're going to move up to 4K and you got a couple hundred bucks, please do it. Uh, one of our tech trainers uh, was telling me the other day that, yeah, I'm using a 50-inch TV to digitize. <laughs> wow. And he loved so uh, this is medium size icons. How do we change them? We just go to tools and options, and then we go to preferences. And you can see at the bottom here, we have other than color or grayscale icons, there are three sizes, small, medium, and large. Large is pretty big for a 27-inch monitor. I mean, yeah, great for presentations and all, but um, medium seems to work just perfect for me. Um, the other thing that Design Shop 11 has done is um, we are what's called DPI aware. So in the past, Design Shop was sort of at the, um, <clears throat> it was it was at the, the mercy of Windows to interpolate and to boost things up based on your scaling, Windows scaling. So if you just right click on your desktop and go to display properties, you can see um, Windows will have a recommended um, increased percentage based on the size of your screen. Laptops with 1080 or, um, monitors are at like 125%. This is 150. So Windows is going to boost it up a little bit, but it's not going to add pixels and all that to the icons, which is what makes V10 very blurry as you use it on larger monitors. Um, <clears throat> so also what DPI Aware does is it gets rid of the anti-aliasing. That's sort of, imagine your wireframe lines. Um, they're sort of like faxes, if people remember faxes, um, where it gets kind of stair-stepped as, um, as if you increase the thickness of a line, there's not a lot they could do sometimes. So it gets pretty sketchy. Not the case here. You can zoom right in and the wireframe lines are completely crisp because there's no uh, Windows doesn't have any um, effect on it. So um, also what you notice is all of our text, like I was saying, is much uh, crisper and larger. Um, in V10, you would take up just a little portion of the text and it can be kind of hard to read inside the, the window. So much clearer, much crisper, bolder, just easier on the eyes to look at. Um, also, you can see, of course, over here that the um, palette is uh, much, much larger. And of course, I can go in and save defaults and load palettes, save custom color charts, all that great stuff, just like you always could. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, over in the, uh, we call it the tree view, it's the object list, I guess, officially. Um, that can be kind of small. So let me just run, uh, let's run something here. Um, you can see how small the objects can be um, under the old mode. So now you right click inside of here. Actually, Scott, I can't see it. It's so small. <laughs> oh, okay. well, let's improve that. 
Um, so we have a right click and then tree image size. So we can go up to large and you can see just now you can see them, Mike. Much better, much better. Thank you, Scott. My, my old eyes couldn't see that at all. So yeah, definitely. So this is much easier on the eyes. The other thing you can do if you want to is change the background color to uh, anything you like. I tend to like light gray. It's nice and easy on my eyes. Um, and so the other thing that you might want to do if you move up to um, uh, 4K is increase the point size. So when I uh, highlight um, elements, um, <clears throat> it, you can see the size of the nodes. If you would like that larger, again, tools, options, preferences, and then you can move up in the point size to make them uh, bigger and easier on your eyes. So that's a little bit larger. I find that uh, three quarters of the way up the scale is about good for what I do in 4K. Uh, any questions, Mike? Um, so actually, I've got a question. We haven't got anybody posting questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna help along here. So Scott, you're talking a lot about 4K monitors and high definition. Um, does that require any uh, extra demand on my PC or any components of my my computer? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's always going to be good to have a really good processor, enough RAM. But no, uh, I did really good um, with about a five-year-old PC um, at Melco. So it's a Xeon processor, so not a common thing. I can say, well, it's Intel, you know, this fast. But about less than average um, by today's standards. And... I find it works really good. The video cards have so much memory and they're so incredibly fast now. Um, it, it's just unbelievable. That, but, that video card is probably the most important part of the, the PC, right? The, the better, yeah. better graphics cards you can get typically means the, the better uh, response and results you're gonna get out of that computer with Design Shop. Especially, well, yeah, especially for gaming and all that kind of stuff. But no, really, um, well, I've set several people up with um, video card recommendations. So for something like, oh, 75 bucks gets you a decent 4K supported video card that you just plug into your current PC. And, um, and that works. No, you couldn't play... Uh, Call of Duty, uh, whatever, Black Ops or whatever is out now um, in, in full, <laughs> full resolution. Um, so yeah, no, I, I actually so no, uh, a, no Black Ops and, and, and digitizing at the same time, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unless you have this one. So, you know, I, I was checking and the last computer I bought was 13 years ago here. So I was due for an upgrade. This is about a year ago. And I figured, you know, it's going to last a long time. I'm just going to get a good one. So I paid about 1100 for the box. Um, man, is it wicked. It, it is water cooled. So it's so quiet. You don't hear all the fans blaring away at you all day. Um, and the video card is a, you know, 12 inches long. It, it's, it's a beast. And uh, it does play Call of Duty nicely. <laughs> well, cool, cool. So, um, we don't have any other questions on the high def and the 4K. Um, I know that in the past, um, we've gotten some emails and questions on social media about, um, you know, the icons are so small. Um, the, you know, the, the tree view is really, really small. So if you're having those issues, um, rewatch this video, the beginning of it. Scott, once again, goes through how to do, uh, how to change the size of those components in uh, Design Shop V11. Um, and so, yeah, go ahead and check that out. But yeah, Scott, I think we moved on to the to the next topic, if you're good with that. Okay. Um, so the, the next thing is the new defaults that we um, have created. So um, what we've done is in the past, uh, if you're very experienced, you kind of don't want anybody messing with your defaults. I mean, it's just sort of a, your style of digitizing and how, what the base is when I get started. You know, being older and more practiced, I guess I, I'm like, just leave the stuff basic. You know, I want to control a lot of stuff myself. But the problem is the new user um, 
they don't know what to set. And so when I used to teach class at Melco, sometimes people would come in and they, they hadn't had training yet. They're excited, whatever, they have an order. So they could get letters up on the screen, meaning a company name or something like that. They could get it to the machine and sew it, but then they'd come in and they go, wow, I got my first six shirts back. You know, the stitches are unraveling. We hadn't populated, you know, underlay or lock stitches or all that kind of stuff early in V10 and, and previous. So we, we took a new approach with 11. We're going to go through all defaults of which there's over 500, if you can believe that, in Design Shop. Um, and we're going to set them up. It's impossible to set one default or each default to work on every different type of application. So um, you're going to have to change some for different fabrics. But we can pick a, a down-the-road um, default set that's going to make you successful right out of, out of the blocks if you even you know, don't know what underlay and lock stitches and all this kind of stuff is. Um, if you can spell the letters and, and send it to the machine, you're going to get um, proper foundation stitching and your stitches aren't going to fall out because it will have lock stitches and all that kind of stuff. So um, one thing we did, I'll just do a single line column here just to keep it simple and I'll go through this real fast. So uh, we have go to properties. Um, first of all, for density, we use auto density. If you don't like it, you can change back to the, the numbers um, like always, but this is based on a table system. So between certain widths, it will pick certain densities. You could see as the rule of thumb, the larger the element is in width, the more density that it requires. You don't want a lot of density on very teeny things, small lettering, all that kind of stuff, or you'll clog it. When you get really big, yeah, you did need, do need uh, more stitching. However, we've changed it to where it, it maxes out at 3.6 by default because as it gets larger, you're going to add the auto split or fill if greater than. So it's going to be dropping random needle penetrations to keep it from easily snagging. So there's not a need to go way, way um, up or down in density, whatever you want to call that. So um, you can see that it starts low, but as the element becomes wider, the density increases. See how dense it is now as it's 120 points. That's a half inch, pretty wide. Um, and also notice how the underlay is changing. So I'm at edge walk zigzag here, but as I get really, really thin, it goes to just edge walk and then even thinner, it will go to center walk. So this makes it excellent for scaling wireframe logos because it's going to change underlay based on um, the width of the, of the stitches when you scale them. I can't tell you how many hours I spent, you know, somebody go, okay, we need another version of this logo. Can you boost it up 20%? And then you'd go in, you'd have to adjust lock stitches and change underlays and all that by manually. Now it just does it all automatically. So that's... Um, auto density and I also showed you auto underlay lock stitches are the same way we're going to populate this with a good um, base which is style one seven very important you use an odd number of stitches for the tie-in and then um, default for the tie off so it's going to add lock stitches based on the width of that element also so when it's very thin you'll have two lock stitches three lock stitches four and five um, stuff like that. So really good, good basic um, default values for you. Um, let me just show you another one here. Um, and so those default settings, um, those are going to give you a, a real good result um, out of the box once again. And I apologize, we got my coworker sneaking around behind me. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, those. What I, I remember the first time, and just uh, just to share real quick, um, first time I used the software, uh, I and this was back in '97. Um, mm. I, I I wanted to make uh, something for my wife as a thank you to let me start this business to get an embroidery machine, and so I took Diane script and I did. I think it was on a like an apron for, and I, I did her name in it and. Um, 
the the default settings that you know one would assume that the default settings would be good that I could use Diane script and get something good out of it but the the column widths were so skinny that the embroidery just looked awful and I I, I just felt horrible um, first that you know I ruined the apron and second that I just got this machine and I was getting these results and so it's one of the things that I know as users. Um, uh, uh, Scott and Nate um, and myself and others in the application team, Sam and uh, Samantha and others, um, really trying to get to where out of the box you can have that Diane script and put it on an apron and have good results. And I really think that's where we're at with Design Choppy 11 now. Do you agree with that, Scott? Yeah, exactly. It keeps certain minimum widths and all that stuff. So if you digitize something that's two points wide, you know, the needle's seven. So something that's incredibly thin, it's going to fatten it up for you automatically. Cool. Definitely. As well as a lot of different options. I mean, we haven't gone down. Here's just one road. I mean, you, you can adjust your own, which I'll show you in a second. But also um, we have uh, auto uh, new auto underlay presets. So uh, we'll take this skull design, just an example here. We'll go to multi-line elements so we get all that. You can see all the locks are on, um, but under underlay. So we have auto underlay enabled now. That's like I was explaining based on a four table system. So the wider stuff gets, you get different underlays more and more and more. Um, but we also have uh, three new ones, which is uh, light, medium, and heavy. So you can take a, a logo that's digitized for a lightweight fabric. Now, maybe you're going to sew it on polar fleece. Um, all you have to do is change the, um, the uh, auto underlay, and it will adjust all the underlay thicknesses, densities, everything completely. Oh, that's great. So you can see here, if I undo it, the... Uh, See, this is how it was digitized normally, but now I'm going to run it on something super thick. And so I just adjust light, medium, and heavy. So pretty cool and very um, fast to use. Um, okay, so another thing that we've done is we've enabled a lot of the different features that we used to leave off. So one thing is single line. Um, if, if you have corners that are very um, sharp, it, it, you can't bend your way around the corner. You get needle penetrations too too much on the inside, not enough on the outside. Sometimes needle breaks. Sometimes uh, and and, and all Scott, uh, the uh, when you get too many needle penetrations in the same place, what I've seen is um, you know, especially like on on delicate knit materials. If you start getting too many of those stitches in the same place, it starts acting like a, a boring tool or a cutting tool and starts tearing up that 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 material right it does yeah um a good test is when after you sew you know a new logo um on lightweight knit performance wear something like that is to take and um, hold it up to a light and you'll see if there's holes in it and it's just pounded um you know, the stitches in one area too much, you're going to have trouble. You need to open it up. So part of it, you know, is short stitches. Um, there's videos on that. But um, the short stitches that we have, for example, you can leave them on. And, and usually the rule of thumb is when there's something as small, like teeny letters, you want it turned off because you don't want to go half the distance when it's already a challenge going back and forth. And it's only a little bit over a millimeter. But under advanced, you can see that it's set to turn off or disable short stitches when you go less than two millimeters. So really sweet. That's um, cool. So back to the single line corners, you can see that it caps now. Um, I'll just show you 3D at a certain um, angle. And then if I open it up a little more where it's more than 90, it will change to a style one, which is a miter. So we got all that stuff covered for you, which is super, super cool. Um, I'll delete this and show you one more thing. Then applique, for example, um, which is a tool right here. Um, if I had, oh, let's just say simple diamond. Um, I'll make it bigger because that's kind of small. Pretty small for an applique, huh? 
the, the corners will kick in automatically as we get very tight. You could see that the cover stitching changed also. So there's different values, uh, defaults for applique as well as for the general defaults. Um, but what else is super cool is if you notice right here, we've changed. So there's a style two miter. What is that? Well, you don't really have to know because it's enabled and it's going to help you by default. Um, it's sort of the way that they do tackle twill where you do not bend corners. You just go up straight and then you start the other angle and it makes the corner much better. For the tack down, um, which is for tackle twill, that's all enabled for you. So here again, you're going to get great, great results right off the blocks. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> I want to show you one last thing before I call her a day here. Um, so with alphabet text, um, we have uh, a new puff alphabets. And so uh, I can change to one of the new puffs. We have categories like we've explained before. Um, and so this is digitized for puff. But there's a lot of changes. I mean, here we're using the basic um, underlay and all the kind of stuff that's going to make your normal embroidery successful. But with puff, it's a different story. We don't want zigzag and we don't want um, tight lock stitches. There's just differences for puff. And so uh, here under styles, we have a, a new um, style for puff uh, alphabets. So once I do this and apply it to the project or whatever, you can see it. I, I ran double uh, edge walk underlay with walk normal myself because that's the way I like to do puff. There's so many different ways to do it. Some like a center walk, some like nothing. I mean, some go back and forth twice, but this is what I settled with. So it's turned off the lock stitches and you can see um, it, the density is very, very high. It's also changed lock stitches to style five, which I find works better for applique and uh, for puff and it's a plus um, sign. So anyway, when you use the puff alphabets, don't forget to use the puff alphabet style to be successful. Um, if you do, if you don't like our values and you want to change your own, which I do, the easiest way, start a new window so you get all your defaults are fresh. You haven't got defaults from stuff you've partially digitized and changed values. And then I just will right click on one of the uh, input tools and I'll make whatever changes I'd want. Let's say I want pull compensation for everything to be two points. I can apply that and then right up here we have the, this floppy disk icon so I can save the faults permanently. So once I do that, boom, now they're saved for every new window that I start, I'm going to have those values. So we give you capabilities to set your own, um, but we're going to populate it um, in advance for new users and stuff like that. And generally, you know, we're, we're using the defaults ourselves. So um, hopefully you like the defaults we've picked. Um, the way that it works is if you install Design Shop 11 to a new folder, which you're going to get um, fresh, um, you're going to get the defaults. But then if you change them to what you want, and then you install a new service pack or something like that, we're not going to change them on you. It will see that you've already got a, a defaults file, and then it's not going to mess with it. So um, hopefully, best of both worlds there. Um, any questions, Mike? Yeah, Scott. So um, we do have a question. Uh, um, Rudy and Cindy have um, asked. So Rudy asked, and let me jump up here to Rudy's. Um, is there a way to keep your hoops and defaults when you upgrade to a new version of Design Shop? I noticed I had to add my hoops again after updating. So we'll yeah, start with so that. Yep. If the installation um, with uh, Melco OS or uh, any of the other OSs that we have or Design Shop has a new hoop database, Nate has furiously added just a whole bunch of new hoops, Mighty Hoop, all sorts of other ones allied um, to the hoop database, then you're going to have to reselect the hoops that you want in your list when you do a new installation. The service pack for Design Shop 11 that comes out, it doesn't have a new uh, 
hoop database in it, and so it's not going to change them. So, yeah. I'm missing your voice. There we go. It's that crazy okay. mute. It's that crazy mute button. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, so uh, Cindy asked, um, in addition to Rudy's question, so on the hoops, I assume is what she meant by that. Um, how about additional alphabets? Uh, will they transfer into Design Shop V11 automatically? Um, so I'd have to know what kind of alphabets you're talking about. Um, the version 10, uh, when that was out, we came out with a package of 10 alphabets that you could purchase for it. They're all included stock now. Um, so are they speaking about ALP files or if it's uh, true types or open type fonts? I mean, that's a yeah, she, you know, she she doesn't say so. Cindy, what I would say on top of what um, Scott just mentioned is, um, you know, if it's a if it's a does embroidery font that you created on your own that was outside of that additional pack that we did um, or isn't a true type font, um, when, when Design Shop V11 is installed, it installs in a separate location and has a separate alphabet folder. So if need be, if you find that you can't find that font from Design Shop V10, you can go into the Design Shop V10 alphabets folder, copy that, and paste it into the uh, um, Design Shop V11 alphabets folder. And, and that's how you could get that to be um, uh, to, to, to make that happen. Does that make sense, Scott? Exactly. So that's for um, OFA alphabets, which are wireframe uh, Melco alphabets. A common uh, problem that we, we run into is people will take a true type font that they download from the web wherever, and they will put it into the alphabets folder, and then it doesn't show up. True types and OTFs, open type fonts, you have to install those into Windows. So you just highlight the file, right click, install as a choice usually and it goes into windows you do have to restart design shop whenever you change or add alphabets or whatever because they get registered when the, when the program starts gotcha. so if you just copy it in where is it no you have to restart the software and then it shows up from there cool cool so um another question this one's coming from jason um when you were showing the uh um changing the default settings uh, his mm -hmm. question is, is there a way to get those back to factory reset? Um, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. I, I, uh, I believe the answer to that, um, Jason, there, there's no like a uh, factory reset button. Um, but uh, And this would be something I wouldn't suggest doing all the time. But if you wanted to get it back to factory reset, um, you could go in to the registry um, for Design Shop V11, and you could get rid of that. But I, I think that's probably a very risky thing to do. Um, so we will put that down, Jason, as a as a suggestion, is to have a factory reset um, button in the future. That's a good idea. Uh, and we do have another question from Lorana, Lor Lorena. Um, what's the minimum size 4K monitor that you recommend? They do put them on laptops, right? Like a 15 inch. Yeah, like um, I I know my MacBook Pro has got uh, a 15 inch, um, a high definition, which is the equivalent of a 4K. But in reality, if if you're actually looking at monitors, my my suggestion is I wouldn't go much smaller than, you know, 27, probably. Yes, 24. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and and they're just they're. Just so, I remember when I bought my first 19-inch uh, monitor back in uh, in the early 2000s, and I, I really think I paid almost a thousand bucks for that for that 19-inch monitor. Now they're they're really inexpensive, so I would try to get a, you know a large screen so that um, by the end of the day, if you're looking at that screen all day long, you're not um, you know your eyes aren't fried from from looking at it. Yeah. So somewhere. Yeah, 21, 24, I think, would be the minimum. Um, like a giant advocate of 27. I mean, this is just a 
I've been using it for a year and I still enjoy it every day. So 300 bucks well spent. If you're going to stare at something for how many hours a day, you know, right. it just, it's just worth it. Yeah, definitely. So, um, I want to flip, uh, just a page real quick here, guys. Um, let me do this real quick. Um, I want to give a shout out to, uh, Diane and let me put Scott and I up on the screen here. Uh, oh, we're already up on the screen. Um, I want to give a shout out to Diane, uh, Montre. She, um, she was trying to do a project that, um, needed the laser alignment, but she needed it to be, um, vertically, uh, aligned. Um, so, uh, she had emailed that question in and let me, let me show my screen here. Give me one second. Sure. Pushing so many dang buttons, I forgot where I'm at. So, um, yeah. all right, now we can see it. So, um, because of uh, her request or her question, um, Nate and the applications team did a wonderful video on um, vertical uh, uh, vertical laser alignment. So, in this design, let me just uh, scroll uh, forward to this a little bit. You can see that the design started out, um, well, the intent is to have it be up and down, but for the laser alignment, um, there's a way to make that happen. So um, we will post this link to this video. It's an awesome, awesome video um, to watch. Um, I thought I knew everything about the laser alignment and I learned some stuff from Nate on this. So thank you, Nate, for that. Um, but my point on this is, is if you have questions, um, Right. If you have questions on our products and and the applications that go along with um, uh, with embroidery, um, please email applications at melco.com. Um, you know, Samantha does a design shop talk once a week. Um, that's where we try to answer all the design shop questions in these live sessions that we do on Wednesday. Uh, we also um, take and try to answer all the application and machine questions and so um it is our true intent to make sure that you know uh we hear you um and it and if if, if appropriate we we try to give you solutions um or respond to um you know to your your uh your request so um i just want to give a big shout out to uh um uh, nate and scott do such a wonderful job um keeping the information flowing into our minds as users on how we can use this product better and in more um, more efficient ways, more creative ways. And then also a big shout out to Dan Sweeney on keeping, and I wanna share my screen one more time. Um, and I know you guys have seen this screen before, but I just wanna say, you know, if you get in a bind um, and you're trying to do a, a project, I, I saw someone on social media I think it was earlier this morning or late last night. I know everything starts blending after a while. Um, uh, they were asking about how do I do patches? I'm looking for a patch tutorial. So go to melco-service.com and Dan and his team just do a phenomenal job of keeping this FAQ um, really, really current with uh, the information. And so, you know, there is, uh, if I, if I was looking for this, I could go here. I could find how to do patches. Um, there's even a how-to PDF. All the videos that we do on um, on any day of the week uh, get put into this. And so it's a, it's a really, really good idea um, to check those out. And then the last shout-outs I want to give is I'd like to give a shout-out to Rachel um, and the other um, uh, people that run the For the Love of Melco Embroidery independent group, doesn't have uh, any affiliation as a, as a uh, um, you know, like employees running this. It's, it's actually users running that, that uh, Facebook page. Um, and, and so really good stuff. And then the last shout out is if you're joining us from, um, I believe we are on Instagram this, uh, this fine day for the first time. Um, if you're joining us on Instagram, Welcome. If you have any questions, shout out at applications at melco.com. Um, Scott, any closing thoughts? 
Uh, just that Nate put up a um, playlist for the new features in Design Shop V11, so you can um, have a quick look at those, and it shows you all the different features that are there. Yeah, cool. And then we, we did get one other uh, um, question. Um, this question is from Deciphering Designs, and we're we're going to hang on to this. Uh, uh, Deciphering Designs will hang on to this question. We'll have Sam look at this question, and if it's a bigger project than just answering it on Design Shop Talk, yeah, we'll look at doing a tutorial on that. I think that's a great idea. So we see that uh, that question, um, and I think from there, uh, I am done talking. Um, I I want to wish you all a wonderful and and pos prosperous afternoon. And once again, if there's anything that we can do here at Melco for you, feel free to uh, email those questions to applications at melco.com. Scott, thank you so much for your time today, sir. Yeah, thank you, everyone. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.